My name is Christina Lee, the guest curator of Shirley Zia Stakes and Holders, Hong Kong's exhibition from the 58th Venice Biennale that is currently on view at the M Plus Pavilion. Welcome to our online artist and curator dialogue entitled Shirley Zia's Sculptural Processes, Tools and Objects. Today, it's my pleasure to speak to Shirley Zia. In this conversation, Shirley will discuss her work with various tools throughout her, her two decades of her sculptural practice and unpack some of her thinking processes, play, placing particular emphasis on the ways in which technologies and the objects we, we use shape our realities. Before we start the dialogue, I thought to spend a couple of minutes introducing Shirley's practice as well as the current exhibition on view. In Shirley's two decade long sculptural ex exploration in considering how plastic operates as a signifier of globalization in terms of the material circulation, standardization and industrialization. In her more recent investigation, she looks at plastic ex as an adjective, exploring its resonance, movement and multiplicity and carefully considers what individuals can learn from materials, processes and structures that shape a pluralistic world. The Venice presentation stakeholders and the current exhibition entitled Stakes and Holders in Hong Kong that's currently on view at M Plus Pavilion are made of two site responsive works. Um, negotiate differences in the back, the, which you see is the rhizomatic wooden, wooden um, installation in the back and in the front play court in front of the room. Both of the works are emblematic of Shirley's distinctive use as sculpture to visualize heterogeneity, multidimensional thinking, and negotiation. They feature new developments in her work, for instance, the use of wood as a material, as well as the use of the new techniques in her practices, such as wood turning, 3D printing, and amateur radio transmission. Here's a different view of the two works. Um, on the left, you see um, part of uh, uh, play court and on the right you see parts of uh, negotiated differences. Um, play court features a set of existing and newly made anthropomorphic sculptures on stands and was inspired by Shirley's childhood experience of playing street badminton in Hong Kong. Um, different from the presentation in Venice, in the Hong Kong presentation, the figures and the whole installation is deconstructed and represented in a guise of repose, occupying a zone of potential action. Um, you just, uh, the previous view and this view, um, you can see the deconstructed bleachers that were present in, in Venice in the courtyard and a radio cart receiving, um, that is receiving amateur radio transmissions that are picked up in the vicinity of the site. Um, also on the left hand side, you see a uh, 3D printed uh, head on top of a, a tripod, which is a new sculpture that Shirley's made for the Hong Kong presentation entitled um, Triple Heads. Here, the radio cart is also a new addition to the Hong Kong presentation. The inclusion of amateur radio technology, and in, in this particular case, we're receiving and not transmitting it. Um, really opens up the discussion of um, the, reg the re heavily regulated public domain and the potential potentiality of transforming and reclaiming public space, both in a physical manner and, especially, and also in an invisible way. And here invisible meaning that these are kind of radio signals that are imperceptible, but only made now audible through the installation. Here is a different view from the from where we were standing at, where the where the, the deconstructed bleachers were, and um, you can see um, how the two works here, play court, uh, occupies not only the interior space of the venue but also the exterior space. Um, so you you can distinctly see um, three antennas that are now placed at the exterior, the the foyer of the M Plus Pavilion and see these three functional uh, um, antennas, namely Yagi on the left, that's mounted on the wall, that's a new addition, new antenna added to the Hong Kong presentation, and buddy pole that's um, uh, right next to it, um, that's, you see it's mounted on the ground, and com antenna that's on the rail. And in, tier, in the inside space, you would see um, uh, in, in, the, in the golden stand, um, that's a new, um, in, a new sculpture that Shirley's um, in, introduced and brought to the Hong Kong presentation that's called Sip Tai Head. A lot of Shirley's um, sculptures and how certain materials are, are, are employed or used in, in her sculptures 
really unpack a lot of the different histories and usages of each material and objects. Um, as I briefly mentioned already earlier on, um, badminton, you know, the whole mise-en-scene of, of, of play court really is, is, is evoking a sense of a badminton game in process. And here, um, badminton as a sport, um, its colonial history is definitely alluded to. Um, and in, in this particular element of play court, which is a work that you see in the outdoors, um, shuttle pod, um, really is a reflection of um, Shirley's family history as laborers um, to, to um, rubber and, and vanilla bean plantations. As you can see here, um, the, the red part, which forms the tip of the, the shuttlecock is of rubber, and then the what would usually be the feathers of the uh, shuttlecock are here made of vanilla pods. And there are five of these uh, shuttle pods throughout the exhibition, which um, we really encourage the audience to discover. Here um, is, a, is a view of um, negotiated differences. Um, um, negotiated differences is a, a like play court. Um, it, it actually, the entire exhibition is a very site responsive in its nature. So um, meaning that change and, and kind of adaptability um, to the site are really core aspects of this presentation. So um, meaning that for, in, especially for negotiated differences, there's no fixed form of how it looks. It really, the configuration evolves together in dialogue with the space. Um, for the Hong Kong presentation, um, uh, Shirley focused on really wanted to draw particular attention to the three pillars that are present at the M Plus Pavilion venue and the exposed ceiling ducts here. So what you see here is an overview um, uh, of, of, the, of the work kind of uh, somehow like crisscrossing or trapezing um, uh, across the ceiling cluster. Um, and Negotiate differences is made of uh, made made of around 400 different wooden spindles that are turned uh, using the lathe, and different connectors that are are pre 3D printed, and also around 400 of them. They kind of are in relationship with each other, and um, they really kind of have to support each other um, against the, the the force of gravity. So no no glue is used. So each element kind. Of, each, the way the whole, the whole installation stands really requires a, a deep understanding and negotiation of the different elements of, of that forms this whole, this whole. So I was just mentioning the ceiling cluster um, and together with the table cluster, which you see here in the center with these table legs are two what we call more pre-planned configurations that are uh, particularly developed or presented for the uh, are conceived for the Hong Kong presentation. Whereas other elements, which you see on the left hand, left pillar, um, the, the whole rhizomatic cluster there, there are kind of more what we call uh, freestyling uh, sec sections, which uh, we were working together with the installers to um, present. Here's a different view of the table cluster and you would see kind of um, everyday objects um, such as um, here, on the left and the top, it's like a soy sauce bottle and then a teacup. So objects that, that we uh, often associate with, you know, tape use, that we associate and use on tables. Here's a different view, a closer view of the, the barricade uh, cluster that's on the left hand side, which, is, uh, which was something that we worked together with the installation team to, to form. Um, what you also see, on the left, um, some of the bowling pins there. So there's like recognizable objects. You can either see sports uh, equipment or, or different kind of musical instruments, etc. And then um, here you also would see a gondola or in the center um, that's connecting um, the two different clusters, which harks back to um, Venice, uh, the, the history of Venice. And, and so you can see many different kinds of references from, from different cultures, different geographies, all kind of blended into this installation. 
And here you also see the cube that is kind of nestled here in, 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 in the cluster, which really kind of em emphasizes this, the idea that, you re that the audience is really invited to walk around and even you know, sp spatially negotiate with, uh, with the installation to kind of form different vistas. And each angle really opens up a, a different view of the installation. So I think I'm just going to quickly stop here because we're going to get back to these two specific works um, in the dialogue. So um, yeah, okay. So um, to start, as I mentioned earlier, Shirley, in your practice, um, for a long time you were working with plastics and polymers, and in the recent year you've introduced new elements such as studio equipment, um, other ready-mades which we see, and in the current exhibition, Woods Interior Sculptural Work. Um, I wonder if you can talk about your creative process and such as the relationship between concepts, materials, and the types of tools and technologies you employ. Thank you, Christina. Thank you for the introduction and the overview of the exhibition. Um, to answer your question, indeed, I think through sculpture or I make sculpture in order to work through question I have about what I know and how I experience things. As a matter of fact, in between my undergrad and graduate school, I almost studied, um, I almost wanted to go for a PhD in philosophy. But I thought language is too linear for the kind of philosophy I'm drawn to. So I wanted to do philosophy through body and object in addition to words. So I went for an MFA and study um, and, and use sculpture as my main medium instead. The world presents itself as phenomenon to me. And as I go around the world and look at things around me, I saw a kind of machine aesthetic in objects surrounding us. Um, and then especially uh, uh, styrofoam casts off because they are so readily available around us and you know people use it once and throw it away. And they're kind of this brand new trash and I, you know, it's, it's, they were really curious to me. So I started to investigate styrofoam cast off and, um, and begin my journey on the semiology of plastic. And uh, I was uh, really into the way that how this styrofoam have uh, a kind of function, but then you kind of don't know there's a mystery of them. And as I, work on um, manipulated uh, styrofoam, eventually I want to make my own packaging, so to speak, you know. So in, instead of uh, using packaging to, to package product, I want to make my own styrofoam to package my own desire and my thinking. So, so it comes to a point that when I have to um, uh, machine my own styrofoam because it's very hard to use a um to do you know in 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 a, any kind of regular artist studio you don't you don't have like an injection mold technology to to really mold styrofoam so instead of um using a substitution method which is uh, mold making i resort to subtraction so i would get insulation foam and then i would use a, a router to carve the styrofoam, to make my own styrofoam sculpture. So this is an um, example of some of the early work that I would use a handheld router to um, carve styrofoam. And, and then I was also really intrigued by the process because I am using my hand holding a router to draw on styrofoam. So in a way, my hand is mediated by the machine but then unlike holding a pencil to, to, to make drawing, the machine uh, comes with router bit and the router bit are manufacture item. So they come in a certain dimension. So there's a standardized uh, shape and sizes to the way that I am drawing, so to speak. So I'm also really interested in the, the mediation uh, using the hand through a machine with a, with a given, with the manufacture aesthetics. So, so in, in my mind, that is actually a convergence of all these different subjectivity. And um, so that's kind of how I started using um, 
actually the router is a woodworking machine. So that's, that's actually the first time I use a woodworking uh, machine on material. But unlike wood, styrofoam has no, um, has a lot of gift. It does not have this grain. So in a way I'm not limited to a, a certain direction of movement as in wood, because you have to work with the grain, work with the feet of the router. So here I can do freehand, I can go back and forth. So in a way, um, at that time, I'm actually um, not very familiar. I mean, I, it, the router was a new machine to me, so I just pick it up. And I was quite an amateur, but at the same time, I thought this gives me a lot of freedom if I'm, on, if I'm working on styrofoam rather than on wood. And, and I also see as me, as a woman artist, messing with the father's tool, so to speak, you know, so I, I don't, you know, I don't need to be very sophisticated with the machine in order to make something. So that actually gives me a lot of freedom. Great. Well, thanks for that. Very good. Well, that's a really, it's great that we were able to see some of the images from the exhibition catalog, actually. Uh, perhaps the audience might not be aware. Um, the first two images in your, in the slide was uh, actually juxtaposed with some of the existing kind of lectures and writings that surely you've written and delivered throughout the two year, uh, two, 20, 20 years of your career. So uh, I found it quite fascinating that um, the word negotiation already was like, mentioned there and also the idea of, you know, your work being an intellectual exercise. I mean, these two things are so, so, I feel very kind of the crux of your practice very much so, but only that it's probably evolved in a different manner. And I, I, loved, I love that you also talked about the, the router being a woodworking tool. So it's like all these things, you know, kind of find, find a different manifestation, you know, at this point in, in this, uh, in the presentation stakes and holders um, in Hong Kong. Um, and um, anyway, I think per perhaps my next question would be, you know, since you already talked about the router, you talked about, you know, machine, machine kind of aesthetics and how, you know, it, it's, it's uh, creating all these different kind of uh, objects. Um, how, how would you define, you know, or, or relate to tools and technologies or even the term craft itself in your own sculpture practice? I mean, you talked a little bit about it just now. But um, how, and also how has your understanding of these two terms um, have evolved in, in all these years uh, in relation to, to your practice and also to the changes in society? Thanks for the question. Indeed, I have a very complicated relationship with tools and technology and craft. If we define craft here as practices that associate with the mastering of certain techniques and tools. In fact, craft, in sculpture, it's often a man's stronghold, not woman's. On one side, there is the idea-based art. On the other side, the stuff making, you know, making things. And of course, within stuff making, there is a hierarchy of uh, sculpture, especially if you, you see it in a more traditional um, woodshop. There's always welding on top, and then maybe wood second, and then mold making, and then clay, and then fabric and paper. So there's this sort of unspoken hierarchy contained within sculpture. And in fact, the way I see it, there are actually three biases against craft, the way that how we are using craft right now. And there is the Cartesian bias against body, so you favor idea over body. And there is a patriarchal uh, bias against craft, which is that hierarchy I just talked about. And there is an elitist bias against labor. The last one often calls men to go against men. For example, the welder dude will frown upon conceptual artists saying they can't make anything. And the minimalist will frown upon the welder dude at mere fabricator quite like the way that Da Vinci once insulted Michelangelo as a mere stone cutter. So, but the way I see it, I think craft can be weaponized to counter these biases, which um, the, the feminist movement has shown that that is possible to do that. 
And, but the way that I see it when you weaponize craft to counter this bias is we mean to be a conceptual based thing using craft, but not craft for craft's sake. And then now between craft and technology, actually, I think all tools are technology. Craft is technology. But if in everyday language, we define technology as something that is high tech, then craft maybe is referred to low tech. So there is this um, binary again of the machine made uh, versus handmade. And the way I understand it, it, there is actually a capitalist and patriarchal bias against the handmade. And in my work, I try not to fall into any of these uh, preconceptions. Well, thanks for the really, you know, uh, uh... Well, that was a really interesting kind of breakdown of how you see yourself and, you know, how to, how you define those different terminologies and indeed like how you treated uh, or you started your exploration in plastic. I mean, you, I feel like your work is really always trying to problematize categories. I mean, kind of mess things up a little bit, you know, this kind of like things don't seem as what they are because there's always something else you dig into it and it's full of contradiction. So I think what you've laid out right now is also really demonstrates the way you, you think about objects, concepts, technologies, tools in, in how it's full of different, you know, multiplicities involved. So I, I totally understand. And it makes a lot of sense when you say you don't want to fall into any of these kind of like categories and, and, you know, I, I find it also very interesting when you say that, you know, it seems like craft is such a gendered kind of uh, terminology here and, and, and segueing to your, your Venice uh, presentations. I mean, you know, there is a sense that there are the different technologies you use here, like wood turning or even, um, you know, amateur radio technology seem to be gendered as a very kind of male activity and, yeah, I think maybe it's interesting to, it would be good to kind of, kind of go into the Venice works and um, kind of under this, this kind of umbrella or probably kind of unpack a little bit more um, how you worked with uh, wood turning, for example. So actually for the Venice um, commission, when I first met you in your studio, you began to do, you began to explore wood turning and, you know, you weren't very sure where it was going to be, you know, kind of, you know, both of us would have no idea become this kind of shape and form um, two, three years later. Um, and it's grown into a very beautiful and complex body of work in negotiated differences. Um, can you talk a little bit more beyond what you've just kind of outlined? Uh, what drew you to this specific technique of wood turning? And how do you see the interrelations between, you know, concept material and process in this very specific work? Yeah, so I just want to, since you mentioned the Venice uh, show stakeholder, I just want to show these images of, uh, of one of the installation view of negotiated differences. You can see that's how it's installed there. And um, about your question of using uh, the lathe um, to turn wood, in in, indeed, um, here's a lathe. Uh, uh, it's, um, you know, people ask me, so what you've been using styrofoam and why wood? And usually the way I answer is, is it's less about wood, but it's more about the machine, the, the lathe, you know, like what we just talked about the router. And then I'm thinking about working, you know, I, I teach in an art school and then we have a really big uh, shop. And in the wood shop area, there is, uh, you know, also a machine like table saw and uh, panel saw and whatnot, all cut straight lines, you know. And, uh, but then in the corner of the shop, there is the lathe that was uh, from the 70s, is a Powermatic. And, uh, and it's sitting there, no one, no one uses it. And, and I've been having my eyes on it, it's like, Wait, wait a minute, that's an interesting machine that's sitting in the corner no one used because unlike the other machine in the shop that cuts straight line, this machine is rendering straight item usually, you know, the blanks that you can buy from supplier. It's rendering straight uh, block into a body. 
So I was really uh, drawn to this idea of um, this machine. We, I, I like to, you know, with all the research I've done on, um, you know, mass manufacturing and standardization, the machine is always a tool to render things that are stackable and transportable and then, you know, for, for shipment and for trading and so forth. So, and, but with the lathe, it is something that, you know, you, you actually turning something into a, a body and it's not uh, readily available for stacking and for, you know, mass quantity of shipping and so forth. So there's something really um, uh, curious to me. So I uh, starting to want to learn it. And, and coincidentally, there is a place in a well-being center that offer a course called nonviolent wood turning and and the nonviolence part actually come from a technique a, a communication technique of nonviolence communication which i have heard about it and i use it in some time in my teaching and and i i went to the workshop was like wow what you know what is nonviolent wood turning and it turns out that it's about working with the grain of the wood and not fight it because when when you know on a lathe the wood turn at high speed you're holding a chisel to it and then you really cannot um you have to um respect the material so to speak and uh and i was really drawn to this practice of being really sent it's actually really centering to see the wood turn and then you hold your chisel steady to it you can see an image of me working in my studio. And, um, and then there is, you know, it's very meditative, you know, and then when I first pick up this um, tools or this method, I wasn't thinking so much about I'm gonna use it in my artwork. It's actually more of, uh, uh, you know, it, it's part of my curiosity of going through the world and like discovering things. And at that point, I didn't really know what this is go where this was going and and then I actually find a lot of like mental or health benefit in doing this practice because it's very centering you know calms me down and and um, and it's magical you know with a square block within second it turns into a round thing so and and then but as as I work more on it I realized that um, this could be potentially uh, a new process in my own art practice. And, and then I'm thinking about the lathe could be the, the um, you know, it, it could be the, the router 2.0, you know. So, so because in the years, in the, in, in the intervening years, I've been um, using a lot of uh, found object and then I'm doing a lot of um, manipulation of found objects. So when the lathe came along, I thought it would be really good to return to using a specific machine to do an installation. And, and the 3D printer actually came later. And, and I wasn't the only one who uh, is involved in the wood turning to produce uh, stakeholders and stakes and holders show. But I also, because of the generous uh, support for the commission, I'm able to get an assistant, Jin Choi, who helped me in doing most of the wood turning. So he did a big portion of the wood turning himself. And then uh, I also have a, another assistant, uh, Ivan the Terrible, but he didn't want to work on the lathe. So he ended up um, working on optical net that is one of the pieces uh, uh, in uh, play court. And he's very alert when he at work. It's nice to see the, the different, you know, images and people behind the scenes of, um, you know, this quite a uh, also ambitious and laborious um, presentation. Um, you know, I, I when I when I met you at that time, you were just starting off, and I, I really thought about sometimes this idea of, you know you from the amateur wood turner to now becoming, you know, gaining so much knowledge, you know, like, and also different techniques and, and understanding of, of the wood itself. You know, I think 
you know, this idea of it having to take such a long time almost becomes also part of the whole idea of understanding different subjectivities and, you know, the qualities of the wood and the qualities of, of everything that kind of really puts puts the whole installation negotiated differences together. It's, there's no fast way of doing it. It's almost like it takes that time to embody, you know, the necessary, you know, all the kind of, you know, trials and tribulations in the making of it to also think about the, the installation of it. So yeah, I, and indeed this whole, the, the notion of negotiation takes very different turns here. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not just a conceptual idea. It is really manifested in how you've chosen the tool. Because I think all, all of these different, the, the, the idea of concept process and the tool and let's say the outcome are so intertwined in, in your practice. And I think this is a, is, is a really beautiful way of seeing, you know, in negotiated differences, how they all come together. Um, you talked a little bit about the, the 3D printer, but uh, maybe we can spend a little bit more time to talk about this uh, because, you know, in negotiated differences, you know, you bring together the lathe, which is considered something more kind of archaic or ancient. I mean, um, in, 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 you were just mentioning, you think that that also counts as technology, obviously, but then in our kind of categorization, that's kind of seen as a little bit older or ancient and, and versus a 3D printer, which is a kind of very state of the art, new technology as two different sculptural methods. Um, is there a specific reason why you thought it would be interesting to bring these two quite different um, processes together in negotiated differences? Oh, absolutely. Um, first of all, I want, to, I want to say I agree with you. The term negotiation does, does function on many different levels. And, you know, people like to see the word as referring to uh, the kind of human process between humans, but then sure, you can read any kind of interpretation of the work and then by metaphor or by analogy, that is one form of negotiation. But then at the same time, you know, as a sculptor, I often see objects has to negotiate with each other, you know, and, and then also, you know, as, as a maker using tools, I'm definitely uh, having a negotiation with my tool you know, from the router to the lathe to the 3D printer. And especially if it's something that is new to me as a learner, I, I, I'm learning how to work with the machine and sometimes may not be using, because this is an art project, I may not be using the machine in its intended purposes. So I might mess with it. I might, you know, like purposely turn, you know, air into something that is uh, usable in my work. So, um, and I just want to share an image of uh, the uh, 3D printer with you now. And so this is, uh, I have two 3D printer now and one of them is, is this. And, you know, in the beginning, actually um, 3D printer uh, was a gift for my husband and he actually worked in emerging technology in his work. And he was like, Shirley, you make things. I can't believe you don't have a 3D printer. You know, I got to buy you one for Christmas. And so he did. And then actually that printer was sitting in its box for over a year. I never even opened the box because as someone who worked with material and with my hands and sometime using some machine, it, this is like a really alien thing to me. And then, um, uh, I, I do work with machine, but this is not just a machine in, in the 20th century sense. This is like more like a 21st century machine that we require using software, using a digital file. And there's something that I'm not familiar with. I, I'm, I just don't, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, anything in the digital realm is not um, my expertise. So, so it was sitting there until I started, you know, turning wood. And then at some point I have a collection of all these different spindles. And like I said before, I'm starting to consider, well, maybe this could be turning into um, an, an installation in my art practice that goes beyond a meditation um, practice. And, and then I thought immediately in order to connect these so this spindle needs to be connected 
And then I thought about using the 3D printer and that will be something that I can use. And I also um, discovered that on, uh, uh, on the internet, there are, there are a 3D um, print makers community. And there's all this like file available for download. They are open source that using a Creative Commons license. And then um, I thought, how interesting. So these files of objects exist in the world. So it, it's, it's a kind of virtual ready-made. And all you need to know, all you need to do is to download them and use a 3D printer to actualize it, right? So, so in my mind, these files are the 21st century ready-made. And for someone like me who've been manipulating ready-made in the actual physical sense, this is kind of like a new avenue for me to play with. Now I can manipulate virtual ready-made. And so I download this file and, and oftentimes this file will uh, allow you to customize them. And then there is this sort of joinery form that I base on and then I will customize it and turn it into different angle. Instead of just two ways connection, I make it three way, four way, five way. And, and then, you know, negotiated differences was born at that moment. It's like, okay, oh, use this and uh, connect uh, the, the spindle. So as I'm describing how this come about, I felt like the convergence of this thing just kind of happened. But however, I know it's not, it's actually not random. The interest in bringing different things together, merging industrial with the organic, using the given, the found, are always guiding principle in my practice that finds its way through this new process. And my process, especially regarding to technology, is often research-based. Um, for example, uh, this is an installation from 2004. It's called Power Towers. And at that time, I feel very burned out and needed some energy. And I took the idea literally that uh, you, you don't have energy, you don't have power, just make some power. So, so I started to build power, this power tower, power transmission tower form in my studio. And that led to my research in electricity transmission. And, um, and strangely, that electricity transmission has something related to uh, the invention of synthetic polymer uh, insulator. So even though I started with power tower, it has nothing to do with plastic. At that point, I was like, so how am I gonna, I mean, in 2004, I was still using plastic or synthetic polymer exclusively. So when I started doing my research, I didn't know how it's gonna funnel through into my art practice, but there you go. You know, it actually has everything to do with um, the invention of plastic in terms of uh, large scale transmission of electricity. And another example is um, this show back in 2007, it's called Sink Like a Submarine. And then it has a title piece that have the same, uh, you know, this, this is the title piece for the exhibition. It's also called Sink Like a Submarine. And in this exhibition, I investigate military technology from the ancient time to today. So in exhibition, um, like in this piece, there are a, a sword form, the ancient weapon that combine with actual submarine parts that's purchased from a junkyard. And then in the same show, there are tank tread form. So this is an example. And then also uh, there are a bunch of loom forms in, uh, in this exhibition as well. Because, you know, when, if I'm thinking about um, the different kind of military technology, technology that move through the ages that so you start from sword to um, tanks to submarine and then I see the 21st or 20th the late 20th century and 21st century military military technology are actually computer information technology and uh, and the loom the jacquard loom is actually the loom is programmable it has a punch card technology to them. So it, that, that punch card inspired the invention of the first computer. So 
that's how um, I oftentimes um, start with something, you know, phenomenon, an object, and then I start doing research, and then all this thing kind of converge, and, and then uh, that will be the beginning of a new project. Wow, I mean, I think, I think, I think it's, uh, it's almost like, I mean, everything, I mean, is it accumulation, right? It's like one, one thing leads to another. Uh, it's definitely not like pure coincidence. It's almost like an informed intuition that you kind of accumulate a, a, a way or methodology to look at either a technology, a tool, or, or, or even a, a, a material itself. And I think uh, what you just kind of outlined your, your, in, your entanglement with technology or the thinking about it here just really kind of shows that it's come out of the blue. You know, it's really kind of really following through the way you, you, you really are very rigorous in exploring um, ideas and looking at throughout the history of, of one thing, how it evolved from one thing to another. So the fluidity, the progress, the evolution of objects, I mean, that, that's something, you know, you don't take it as a given. It's like almost very kind of, uh, uh, yeah, like very, very forensic, I guess, in a way. You really kind of trace it, you know, where it goes. I mean, I think that's also seen in negotiated differences where, you know, it is really all different spindles that are there, you know, it really kind of goes through different his, you know, different times, different cultures, you know, you're bringing all these things together, um, objects that could be turned by a lathe, obviously, and here I'm talking about. Um, I mean, we kind of touched upon it a little bit before, but um, as, as, you know, time and skill are, are actually obviously very important elements here when you talk about you know, how you hone the craft of wood turning. I mean, I, I almost almost even see, because um, I'm so, you know, kind of familiar with the work now, you know, I have a timestamp of everything that's in, you know, in, in the installation. I'm like, okay, that was done first. And then, then you went to the off axis, um, you know, wood turning. So it's really kind of a diary of your, you know, how you're acquiring and honing your skill in wood turning. And whereas, you know, technology kind of what we understand or how we kind of understand or, yeah, we kind of think it signifies like speed, efficiency, you know, also all that kind of thing seems to be at odds with that kind of the process that, that, that you know, negotiate differences and, you know, the whole exhibition in itself kind of seem to signify uh, I know you spent quite some years with the lathe and then the process of even making a 3D connector can take somewhere between what, six to 12 hours per connector. So I, I see your work not only is material or even just process driven, but really concepts play a super crucial role. So how has, you know, working on this project uh, or this in the two different installations further thinking about these, these different kind of concepts? Well, um, indeed, to carry on with the 3D printer and, you know, that you describe that is very time consuming. And um, yes, it is. <laughs> you would think that it takes, you know, oh, just let the machine do all the work. But it's, it's um, especially this is, uh, you know, quite a new technology. There is still, with, even within the community, there is still a lot of trial and error, especially with uh, newer filament. And then I'm using a filament that is, is, is considered experimental. It's not just plastic. I'm using a composite of wood and metal. And oftentimes, you know, the printer might throw an error. And then you can see an image here that it's uh, something happened, it's going awry. And, um, and you know, and to, to respond to your, your, your timestamp, this is an image to show you. Sometime for like a simple print of a 90 degree two ways printer, uh, two way uh, connectors, I need to try five times in order to get um, the, the you know, a usable connector that uh, I can use. And, and then and later on in the, in the project, I realized that if I'm only using a printer to print this curved surface that's sitting on, on a bed, 
then I'm losing some of the resolution of the bed. So I have to use a substrate, a, a supporting material to, I have to print that first before the, the connector can sit on it so that I can have a perfect curvature at the bottom. And that requires even more time because I have to use a soluble uh, supporting material. And then after it's printed, I need to soak it overnight. And, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I, I, I joked to you that at one point I'm sitting by my 3D printer is as if I'm a mom watching the baby in the incubators. And then after the baby is born, I have to wash it, you know, so that's uh, that's the kind of labor that involve, even though, you know, we are talking about a machine here. And indeed, sometimes uh, after I'm doing, you know, I experience a few of these so-called print era. And, and since I'm not using it in a really, uh, you know, functional way, this is part of an art project. I actually embrace the, um, this print era. And throughout the exhibition, you will find some connector looks like they have not finished printing, or some of them looks like there has been an error that's made. Some of them literally it looks like it, there was an earthquake and it shifted. And we nicknamed that the earthquake connector. And so at one point I was like, you know what, actually, why don't I just make a, uh, purposely made a connector that looks like it's a, it's a mistake. So I thought about using the Siamese twin as a way to, um, to do it. So this is kind of faking the effect of a print era. And uh, you can see that that connector, if you have a chance to go to the Ampus Pavilion, look for the middle pillar, it's right here. It's kind of like magical that one connector is not, uh, is attached to the other one is not falling down. And to respond to your questions about technology and how, how it uh, conceptually related back to my practice, indeed, I, the way I use tool and technology, I always emphasize the, the non-uniformity. -uni so like I said before, the machine oftentimes likes to cut straight line. It likes to produce things that are exactly the same so it can be rendered into stacking or, and, and stocking and uh, standardization, you know, have this sort of uniformity. And the way when the machine comes into my hand, when the technology comes into my hand, I'm, I'm trying to, to use it in as many different ways as possible, you know, negotiate a difference. And, and this is no, no different, you know, in terms of the, the 3D printer. And for each, because the file is customizable. So I would uh, change the file a little bit because it allows you to have different settings in terms of temperatures and speed of certain things. So I would change the setting a little bit for each different File. So we have like, I don't know, 480 connectors in the show. And I would say, you know, there are as many as at least 300 different files um, for all those connectors. They, some, they, they are all slightly different. And, and the, uh, why do I go, go for such great length to do it? Because conceptually, I want this non-uniformity to counter the, the idea of efficiency. I want to resist being subsumed by the system, by the sort of capitalistic patriarchal system that we just talked about early on. And I want to emphasize um, this sort of uh, a, a kind of, this, I want to slow it down. You know, the slowness is, to me is a kind of meditation for our well being. And perhaps I, I, I am bracing myself for a kind of technocratic dystopia that is uh, happening. And, uh, and I'm hoping in my work, I can destabilize or problematize this sort of technocratic um, machine. And so, but on the other hand, I will also say that um, in my embracing of digital technology, thinking about the zero and one, and this sort of coding, it also gave me great revelation. For example, back to the, um, you know, my 
my interest in heterogeneity through plastic. And actually, at some point, I stopped using plastic exclusively and I opened myself to other material because one day it kind of dawned on me that plastic is not a substance, really, because it's, it's a petroleum derived product. And when you look at it, it's really is uh, plastic is, is made of carbon molecule. It's just made of molecule that has a structure that is so complex that chemists is able to coax this carbon molecule into a complex chain called polymer that they're not able to unwind it. That explains the non-biodegradable part. And so when I, when I understand it, all of a sudden, to me, plastic is no longer a substance. It's a code. It's a formula. It's a syntax. It's the organization principle of some natural material. And so from that point on, I want to uh, uh, move away from plastic as a substance and move to plastic as in and as, as quality of, of, uh, of being malleable, of being a code, of being an organization principle. So in, in other words, plasticity. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, you know, this whole, when you were saying, you know, the technocratic kind of dystopia and, you know, the slow down and kind of, I mean, I wonder, I mean, maybe this is just me um, drawing some lines here, but I, the next question I wanted to ask was connected to play court. You know, uh, play court, you use this uh, more kind of old school transmission technology, you know, like, um, I wonder if, you know, there is an additional element you added to play court, which kind of evokes a sense of a, a badminton game that's in process and, you know, also adds to it a, a sites responsive kind of element because it kind of opens up the narratives that are you know, in the vicinity of the space. Um, were you interested, why were you interested to add this to this piece? Was it somehow, if I was just kind of like responding to your previous point about having a form of resistance to kind of this technocratic dystopia, is there that kind of like, you know, kind of sentiment in that? Um, can you, yeah, can you also talk about why this might be important to your idea of negotiation, you know, in this piece and the public sphere? The radio and ham radio or ham armature radio. Actually, the, I think we need to go back to uh, the, the form of sculpture on stand. And um, that sculptural language of putting sculpture on stands or tripod and whatnot actually developed out of um, of a solo show I did uh, back in uh, 2017, or actually 2016. And um, it's called Lift Me Up So I Can See You Better. And, and quickly in that show, it's, it's about seeing from different perspective. So some of them are where it's inspired by Oscar Wilde um, uh, children book called The Happy Prince. And uh, I'm not going to go into details of that, but it's, it's about um, the ability to see from uh, a point higher up. And, and from that point on, I had wanted to make an installation where sculptures are placed on all different kind of level in terms of, the, of, a, of a seeing perspective. So that's how I first developed using a tripod. And then, um, in Venice, because the uh, because play court uh, was a, still is a site responsive piece, and when I first did the site visit, I I saw that this is a very residential area, and you can still see laundry line being strung across the courtyard, and uh, you can hear people talking, um, because people are still living around the the, the venue where we had uh, the stakeholders. And I can hear washing machine running. And so the idea is also to make something more vertical to, in order to draw the viewer's sight line towards you know, um, the laundry line. 
and hear the sound. So I immediately think about, first of all, I need to use the telescopic uh, sculptural language that I developed a few years ago. And secondly, I need to incorporate sound to echo the soundscape that is so rich in that courtyard in Venice already. And because um, I was also thinking about having an element of Hong Kong history and then Hong Kong history in a large part to me is colonial history. So I thought about using um, uh, badminton as, uh, as, as part of the, this imagined scenario for play court. And to me, playing street badminton is an act of uh, claiming public domain. You're sticking your claim of public space. And, and then immediately I think about, you know, using ham armature radio because uh, like badminton claiming physical space, um, the armature radio is claiming airspace. And what it is, is actually, you know, just think about, you know, on the, in the internet, there are a chat room, right? There's online forum and you are having conversation, two persons having conversation in the chat room, but other people are able to see it or hear it, or mostly read it, you know, in the internet. And so the ham radio is basically the chat room or the forum before internet time and it's still ongoing. But uh, ever since the after Second World War, a lot of this uh, frequency uh, of our airwave has already uh, been used by government and corporation. The range of frequency uh, left that's available for ham radio operators really, really narrow. And so, but they are still doing it. And to, to me, uh, this ham radio operator is actually uh, claiming uh, public space a public domain. And it is also, this is a, a, a shot of uh, the disco. Uh, it's sort of in this sort of umbrella shape uh, because it's able to receive signal from all different angles. Um, this is the install at the outdoor area at M plus right now. And I also want to say, and there's another view of the other uh, two antenna opposing uh, disco. It is, um, ham radio is still the person to person communication without the mediation of government or big tech firm platform. So even though we're doing this right now, Zoom, you know, we are communicating for a, a tech firm platform. But radio, how much radio does not, you just need to get your own equipment and a license and you don't need to meet be mediate through all this big giant tech firm. So that is, that is one way of resisting. Not to kind of draw too, too literal kind of comparison to negotiate the differences, but it is kind of like having subjectivities in direct contact with each other that there's not like, it's, it's, it's not top down, you know, it's really kind of more bottom up, right? It's like really yeah. kind of trying, you know, really, asserting that, you know, each of these entities, I mean, I'm talking about, you know, the ham radio operators, they have their own agency, they want to communicate and they're seeking communication with each other. So I, do see, I see a lot of uh, kind of uh, uh, resonances also with, you know, the way you look at society, the way you see how everyone's interrelated to each other um, in stakes and holders. I really see it kind of really very intertwined it's, it's also kind of talks about in a different way I mean for those yeah I think uh, also it's important it, it's important to note that um, in in the Hong Kong presentation there's two um, different radio um, radios that are being receiving different signals the one indoors are are just receiving are receiving like ham radio operators kind of transmissions we're just receiving and then in the exterior space with this cone, uh, with the kind of multi-angled um, uh, uh, antenna is receiving non-commercial kind of uh, transmission. So there's kind of two different types of like audio kind of histories or, you know, or realities that are presented in, at, the, at the pavilion here. Um, so kind of moving, I mean, we, 
we were, I mean, it was really throughout your work. I mean, when you talked about um, even sink like a submarine, you know, all, I mean, even for power towers, I think, you know, narratives, I mean, be it very personal, it could be social, historical. I mean, what you just previous, the past, you know, yeah, you were t in the past couple of questions, you really showed how, you know, it's so multifaceted, you know, different narratives, you know, personal, social, uh, historical, or even cultural histories behind the materials and forms. I mean, the way you mine it from everyday life uh, and use it in your works. I mean, they're very complex. Can you share some of the notable objects that you've included in stakeholders or in, in the Hong Kong presentation stakes and holders um, that you would you know, want to highlight or um, and would you say that um, your selection and decision what to use or include has differed to how you um, treat or handle these objects in the past? Yes, actually, uh, back to the radio a little bit. Um, the radio, uh, we, we, have, we have two radio in the Amplus pavilions and they both non-commercial, so to speak. The, the technical terms is it's just amateur radio. Uh, reception and in the indoor space we have it set up so you can receive signal from closer range and uh, and farther range so in the indoor space you're able to hear transmission that take place from a distance from Hong Kong in the more regional um, reception and in the outdoor foyer area we have it set up so that you can hear more local transmission. So you have the, the closer and the farther in that. Indeed, there are um, many narratives uh, in, in this show uh, as well as in Venice. And uh, well, first of all, I want to say that, again, I want to emphasize um, the work is always open to different interpretations. So different people come in the show, come with their own experience and what they know about a certain object, they might have a different interpretation, they have a different read, and um, that, is, that is all part of the work to, to um, be able to uh, uh, allow for all this converging narrative to come together at the same time. So, and I would say uh, for stakeholders, because of certain objects I use that my, and in the context of Hong Kong, that might conjure up a more specific narrative and that is more direct than, you know, perhaps in Venice or in my other show. And um, I was, the last time I was in Hong Kong um, was in August 20, 19 and we were doing some public programs and then you know i'm also preparing for the stake and holder show and usually when i do that i would go around the city and collect visual information and try to incorporate um, a new component into the installation so just as in venice you know I, when i did a, a walk around in venice i i thought i could use a gondola or and this sort of like peer mooring post. So we incorporate that in Venice. And then in August in Hong Kong, uh, it was during the time when there was a lot of protests going on. So on the street, I see safety helmet, I see traffic cones, I see barricade, you know, umbrella stamp. Um, so, and I would just, um, thought that, you know, when you, especially with the wood turning, you know, when you've been turning wood uh, for a while, you become hypersensitive to um, object that could be turned on a lathe. So, and uh, if I may go back to traffic cone. So like, you know, for example, I saw the traffic cone in the street. I was like, oh my God, you know, this is an object that had a central axis. So that means I can put it on a lathe and turn it. And so, um, yes, indeed, some of these objects has a more direct read to it, you know, and then you can form a narrative about it more specific to Hong Kong during that time than uh, in other 
times of my practice, the narrative may be a little bit more convoluted. You know, I'm thinking about Quantum Shirley, you know, has a very <laughs> multiple narrative that kind of converge together into the Quantum Shirley series and is oftentimes not directly accessible, so to speak, uh, from the viewer's perspective. Yeah, I mean, speaking about it being directly accessible, I remember when I was in Venice, you know, because we were giving some tours and then it's really interesting to see people from different, you know, uh, cultural contexts respond very differently to the objects, you know, like I remember at Banksia Pod and um, I, I think most people didn't really recognize it or had different, someone told me, oh, they saw it in South Africa, some sort of like incense holder um, or diffuser. And then a group from Australia just pointed at it and said, Banksia Pod, you know? So it's like people kind of, I think what's really beautiful about the work um, or actually the fact that you bring in these ready-mades because it, it kind of evokes everyone's personal imaginations behind it or their personal associations. And that's why it's so, that's why it's the narratives that you bring together are not the only ones that you bring, you've, you've, you've affix it to the works. It's like, there's all, it, there's possibilities of other ways of kind of, you know, uh, putting different images or narratives together. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess uh, this kind of like goes, well, I think probably it's, it's, we don't have much time left and I think it's good to kind of move to the last question. I mean, the fact that we're talking uh, over Zoom um, and not face to face and, you know, uh, really tells us, you know, the, the, you know, how technology is so important during these um, times during the pandemic, you know, speaking of the technology, of technology itself, I mean, the setting up of the show relied very heavily on it. And as we were not able to come to Hong Kong to oversee the installation. Um, I know it hasn't been an easy process uh, for everyone involved. Um, and I just wondered, could you share some thoughts that you might have had that, you know, this whole process might have triggered um, any kind of further reflection about the uses or limitations of, of technology for you? Yeah. Well, let me quickly respond to uh, the different interpretation of the narrative again. Um, you know, people are reading, especially in negotiated differences, they, they point out, oh, this is a soy sauce bottle and that is a baseball bat and that's a traffic cone. But mind you, um, they are not ready made. I make them, I carve them, you know, they are sculpture. They all come from wood, you know, when we say a soy sauce bottle, it's not like you can pour soy sauce and <laughs> put in your food. So I, I just love that people are, you know, starting to talk as if they are real thing, but they're not, they're sculpture, they're still sculpture. And the most amazing thing is it all come from, you know, the wood, you know, the wood species family, you know, from one thing, it, it's kind of sprouted it all, like the whole universe. So that is kind of something that I, I, I find a lot of pressure with. And uh, let me get to the, the remote installation part now. This um, installation that we're doing at a distance and also asynchronously is indeed really challenging. For me, it feels very mediated. You know, I'm mediated through the screen and very disembodied. And um, because, um, you know, in order to get the visual information of how the sculpture look or feel in the space, if I were to go there, um, it might only take me 20 seconds to get the visual information I need to know what to do in the next move. But in our process, it's... Um, <laughs> This is the slide of both of us at work. You know, you're seeing that we are, we are using multiple screen-based way to inform our three-dimensional navigation. So in order to get that information in, 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 uh, in life, I could do it in 20 seconds. But, but doing it this way for multiple, 
multiple screen, it might take me 20 minutes to look through all the live cams, all the pictures, all the recording, all the video, or to instruct um, Olivia, the assistant curator, to move around the space for us. So it's, it's very time consuming. And then also, mind you, um, when we say uh, remote installation, it's not like I have very specific installation instruction and just deliver to the install team and they can just execute it. It's not so straightforward. Some part of the show is like that. You know, some of the sculpture in play court is rather fixed and you just have to uh, instruct them where to place it and how to adjust the angle and then it could be done. But the interrelations between the object is a lot more complicated. And on top of that, we've negotiated differences as you talked about. Uh, some part of the installation is pre-planned, but mo a lot of the, um, when we call them cluster, but the connection between the clusters are, are meant to be improvised, meant to be freestyled at the site. So, um, and just imagine that it's not exactly remote installation. I've been calling it um, guided improvisation as a distance and asynchronously. So, so it's really, it's not just a straightforward thing. And, and because of this sort of disembodiment that I'm feeling, sometimes I, I, I have to actually use analog means to, to communicate how I want a certain object angle tweak. So I end up actually using paper sculpture, you know, holding uh, it with a tweezer. And then, you know, I put it in front of my laptop and then I use uh, my, my, my cell phone to, to make the video tutorial to show how it should be adjusted. So, and uh, there's really is a big disconnect between the differences between analog and the digital. And even though we try, I still think that um, there's no substitute for presence. And, uh, but that is uh, what we need to learn to adjust to in this era of uncertainty and uh, with social distancing. But I will say, despite all the challenge, maybe you can, share with the audience too. So despite, you know, the, the challenges, you know, we thought this is kind of like impossible, but we did it, you know, for something not straightforward, uh, no fixed instruction, involved improvisation and adaptability. We're able to do it. So I think that's very encouraging, you know, for perhaps for other artists to embrace it. Well, I mean, I have to say, I mean, it's almost like we're entering the whole process with you. I mean, in a way, you're always troubleshooting in your work. You know, it's almost like you want to use a tool and you want to figure out how to use it. It's almost like we are given this tool called technology, like called remote installing. And we're all figuring it out together with you in a way, I think, you know, like, oh, it doesn't work. Okay, let's try to find this way with the tweezer and showing, you know, this, you know, it's, it's like, it's like your kind of artistic approach is very much felt, I think, in how we're trying to somehow hone or, 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 or streamline the process of working together. So I thought that was Did super process, interesting. Sorry, <laughs> into the process is negotiated differences, right? So we're negotiating on this multiple screen and across distance and time and it's, it's play court too. You know, yeah. it's very playful. And then, yeah. yeah, so, and then there's a lot of back and forth like the badminton. So it indeed is, is a, it is an apt metaphor. But yeah. I also want to uh, show you a couple more images I have is that, you know, in this sort of figuring out, we, um, I also have make drawing uh, for the crew. And then sometimes the drawing is just showing direction of where the spindle should go. You know, this is a mm -hmm. kind of how the bowling pin should fall, but, I actually didn't give them exact direction of which spindle to use and what angle co connector to use. And, and another one is the cube area that um, you might remember from the slide. Yeah. And I only have roughly an idea of where the cube should be, but 
it's uh, with this sort of long penetrating uh, spindle, but I don't have exact direction of what spindle to use and what connector to use. Yeah, I remember you were saying that you're, yeah, making these sketches seem was very an interesting process for you. I think, I think beyond the word uh, being feeling disembodied, I think the word tactility is so important here because I mean, you're trying to find a way to have that tactile touch, you know, across the screens, you know, like how do you, you know, feel that you're molding this thing. And then I think you found these sketches as a, as a means to do it or one thing to bridge that lack of tactility fundamentally, I feel. Um, yeah, I think uh, maybe we should end here. Um, well, thank you so much, Shirley, for being so generous and, you know, giving us um, so much of your time and to share with us the thinking process that goes behind these th th throughout your practice and in particular, these two installations that are so laboriously and, you know, thoughtfully put together. Um, if um, for the audiences, if you want some more information, uh, both online and offline public programming, or to get a copy of the catalog, which there are some pages that uh, was featured in this presentation, please feel free to go to the M plus website. Um, I hope that everyone will have a chance to see the show in person. Um, the show stakes and holders is open at M plus pavilion till October the 4th. Um, thank you, everybody. <laughs>